common sense and financially sound alternatives. Patient-centered reforms that allow individuals to get the care they need from the doctor that they want at a price they can afford. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise. Senator from Utah. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of Amendment 680 that uh, we have filed. I am concerned that the bill before us will have only marginal effects on China's manipulation of its currency. My amendment offers a different approach, one which I believe will be more effective over the long term. Let me first say that I strongly agree with the sponsors of this bill about the need to send a strong signal to China and other currency manipulators as well that massive intervention in the currency markets to gain trade advantage will no longer be tolerated. For the international economic system to work, every country, including China, needs to play by the rules. Like many of my colleagues, my frustrations with China's trade and economic practices go far beyond currency manipulation. China's failure to protect intellectual property rights, for example, China's industrial policies, their limitations on American investment, and their unfair support and subsidization of state-owned and state-assisted enterprises are all very serious problems that we need to address. So while today we are focusing on currency manipulation, I look forward to working with Senator Baucus to examine potential solutions to these problems through the Finance Committee and through Finance Committee hearings on China, which I hope we will hold soon. The sponsors of this bill assure us that their approach is WTO consistent and will not result in a trade war with one of our largest trading partners. Now, given the importance of these questions, I wrote Secretary Geithner and Ambassador Kirk to request the administration's views. While they assured us that they are reviewing the bill, to date they have not publicly weighed in one way or the other. Now, it seems to me they really need to weigh in on this. Given that they know the Senate is debating the legislation this week, I think this is very unfortunate. If the administration is going to have any impact on this debate, I would urge them to comment soon. Even though I have supported similar legislation in the past, I have continuing reservations about this approach. Fundamentally, we must remain focused on one question. Will this legislation actually solve the currency problem with China? And after careful consideration, I've come to the conclusion that it will not. While well-intentioned, the bill is too focused on unilateral remedial actions. As a, as a result, I feel, fear that the bill will only have a marginal effect on China's practices, while at the same time potentially targeting many U.S. exporters for trade retaliation by China. For example, the Congressional Budget Office scored this bill as generating $61 million dollars in revenue over 10 years. To put this in context, in 2010 alone, the United States imported almost 365 billions of dollars of goods from China. Given the scope of the problem, I find it difficult to believe that unilaterally imposing an additional $6 million in anti-dumping and countervailing duties a year on Chinese imports will compel China to, char to change its currency policies or have any meaningful impact on our trade deficit with China. Many of the other remedial provisions in this bill require the United States government to take other unilateral actions against China, many of which may actually harm U.S. exporters directly or expose them to potential retaliation by the Chinese. To succeed over the long term, I think we must go in a different uh, direction. My amendment does just that. My amendment strikes the unilateral provisions while retaining the, cone of the, bill, the core of the bill that actually advances our shared goal of combating Chinese currency practices. I agree with my colleagues that the exchange rates and International Economic Policy Coordination Act of 1988 is simply not working. Administration after administration refuses to exercise its authority and deem China a currency manipulator. This is enormously frustrating to all of us, especially since candidate Obama campaigned against China's current currency practices, and after being elected, had his own Treasury Secretary testify before Congress that China is, in fact, manipulating its currency. Yet they refuse to act. 
So I agree that Congress must tighten the criteria and establish a more objective approach to identifying fundamentally misaligned currencies and designating fundamentally misaligned currencies for priority action. I have supported this goal in the past and continue to today. I also agree that we need to hold the, Treasury, the Secretary of Treasury and the U.S. Trade Representative accountable. So I've retained the, uh, you know, the requirements under this bill that they report to and testify before Congress on their progress. But to succeed over the long term, we need to adopt a fundamentally different approach. We have had some success in the past. For example, during the Bush administration from 2005 to 2008, negotiations pushed China to appreciate its currency by 20 percent. Unfortunately, the Obama administration has had no such success. My amendment builds on this successful model, but also takes it a step further. First, my amendment directs the Secretary of the Treasury and U.S. Trade Representative to initiate negotiations in the World Trade Organization and the International Monetary Fund to develop effective remedial rules and actions that will mitigate the adverse trade and economic effects of fundamentally misaligned currencies designated for priority action under this bill and that will encourage priority action countries to adopt appropriate policies to eliminate the fundamental misalignment of their currencies. The WTO and the IMF were designed to handle complex issues like currency, so we should start there and work with our allies to devise long-term and effective solutions. Working with like-minded countries, we should be able to agree that when individual members advance their nationalistic interests, uh, interests so aggressively through currency manipulation, they threaten the whole global economy and their own long-term interests, and that their actions need to be addressed. Now, many of uh, my colleagues may argue that negotiations in the WTO and IMF will not work. My amendment addresses that potential problem in its second section. It provides that if the Secretary of the Treasury and U.S. Trade Representative cannot make progress to effectively mitigate the adverse effects of fundamentally misaligned currencies within the WTO and the IMF in 90 days, then the administration shall enter into plurilateral negotiations outside of the WTO and IMF to develop agreements with our friends and allies who are also committed to open and fair currency policies. These negotiations will need to develop mechanisms to mitigate the adverse effects of priority action, uh, country currency policies, and to encourage those priority action countries to abandon their interventions into their currencies. We have seen multilateral approaches work in the past in combating some of China's unfair trade and economic practices. For, for example, China changed course on both its aggressive indigenous innovation policies and on efforts to hoard its rare earth materials primarily due to multilateral pressure against the Chinese. These important issues have not been solved and require additional efforts, but by working with our friends and our allies, we effectively convinced the Chinese government to take a more constructive approach. Let's build on the successes that we have witnessed in recent years, and let's work together to counter in a systematic and comprehensive way the efforts of those priority action countries that derive trade advantages through current policy. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that the United States violate any of its international obligations, and that point is made clear in the amendment, but I am suggesting that the solution to the currency problem cannot be achieved unilaterally and our negotiators must reach out to our allies to aggressively counter the behavior of China and others. So far, the administration has failed to lead on the currency issue. My amendment requires that they do so. The third section of my amendment helps maintain pressure on the administration to take concrete action. It requires the Treasury Department and USTR to report to Congress every 180 days following enactment of this bill. In these reports, the administration must identify, one, the countries with which the United States is conducting negotiations to mitigate the adverse effects of priority action currencies, and in what international fora 
or negotiating configuration, those negotiations are taking place. Two, the remedial rules and actions under discussion in those negotiations. Three, any remedial rules that have been adopted and any remedial actions that have been taken pursuant to those negotiations. And four, what if any additional authority the Secretary or the U.S. Trade Representative needs from Congress to conduct these negotiations and to effectively mitigate the adverse trade and economic effects of fundamentally misaligned currencies or to implement coordinated actions with other countries. Finally, my amendment sets up a process to immediately take advantage of ongoing international trade negotiations by establishing a new priority negotiating objective of the United States for ongoing and future trade agreements. This new objective requires that each party agree to not fundamentally misalign its currency in a manner that would result in a priority action designation and agree to work together to mitigate the adverse trade and economic effects of fundamentally misaligned currencies by non-parties such as China. For example, if the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations are to tackle 21st century trade and investment issues as the USTR continues to promise, I think this plurilateral negotiation would be a great place to start to address the challenges of fundamentally misaligned currencies. Working with this group of like-minded countries, we should be able to agree amongst all nine parties that no party will fundamentally misalign its currency. We should also be able to agree to work together to counter the actions of other countries whose interventions in currency markets destabilize the global economy. We have also seen multilateral engagement work in other areas. If we are truly going to solve this currency problem, we need to look at what other efforts have actually produced some results in moving the Chinese off a mercantilist policy course and improve the conditions for American businesses and workers competing against the Chinese. We can all agree that China's massive interventions in its financial sector and currency have disrupted, disrupted global, global trade and that its efforts to benefit China at the expense of others has, har have, has harmed many countries and workers, including many here in our own United States. But I believe that rather than merely send a message to China, we must try and find real long-term solutions and empower and direct our negotiators to reach out to our friends and allies around the world to finally solve the problem. If existing institutions are not working, we must modify them. If that is not possible, we must look to create new effective international agreements. The, ch the challenge that China's currency interventions present are not just to the United States, but to the international economic community. We, the Congress, must demand that the administration launch these critical negotiations so we can avert further damage by currency policies of countries like China. So I call on my colleagues to join me and to not just send a message, but to take actions that could, in fact, produce results. In the end, China itself, as well as its neighbors and trading partners, will all benefit from a more open, transparent, and fairly exchanged currency regime. What is at stake is far more than making a statement. We need to actually alter the international agreements and the rules of the game to address the problems of today and tomorrow. So I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and, uh, when it comes up, and I hope that we can get it up uh, once uh, we come to the final agreement on how to proceed on this bill. Mr. President, uh, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from New York. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I am, my main purpose here is to address the China Currency Bill, particularly in regards to the remarks of Speaker Boehner and Chairman Bernanke. But there are two other points I wish to make on previous speakers' comments first. First, Senator Webb's amendment. It's a very important amendment. What it says, of course, is that in cases where commercial technologies are developed with the support of U.S. taxpayers, it prohibits companies from transferring the technology to countries that force proprietary trans 
uh, transfer as a condition of doing business. We've seen this over and over again. China, which doesn't play fair up and down the line, they basically get away with economic murder. One of their techniques is to say to big American companies, we'll allow you to sell a ton of stuff to us. You'll make lots of money. But in return, you must give us your proprietary technology, basically your family jewels. It's outrageous. And in the long run, it weakens America's ability to grow and create jobs. The companies do this because in the five or ten year period in which they've signed the contract, they get a lot of revenue. But it certainly hurts American workers, and it certainly hurts these companies in the long run, but the CEOs probably figure they'll be long gone before that money is made. So I want to support Senator Webb's amendment. Now, in regard to my good friend from Utah who proposed an alternative, I would say this. We've tried for a decade to get multilateral action. That involves getting China's acquiescence. It's not going to happen. Multilateral action, like saying to the Chinese, please, that hasn't worked, it won't work, and it will not work. Our legislation is much stronger. And it can pass. It got a large vote here last week, this week. It has bipartisan support. I know that Speaker Boehner, I'll talk about this in a minute, has said he won't take up our bill, but there's going to be huge pressure for him to do so, as I'll elaborate later. So to my good friend from Utah, and I have tremendous respect for him, and I don't doubt for a minute his good intentions, his integrity, his hard work, and desire to see things happen. To say to the Chinese, please negotiate, is a strategy for weakness, is a strategy for failure, and multilateral action will not succeed. The Chinese understand only one thing, and I will yield for a brief moment to my colleague for a question or a comment, whichever he prefers. But the Chinese only understand one thing, being tough, telling them if they don't discontinue these actions, we are going to take action unilaterally on our own. I've been doing this for years. I can tell you, China's policies get worse and worse and worse. And as one of my constituents said to me, Uncle Sam, when it comes to China, is Uncle Sap. To have a policy that involves large multilateral actions and says to the Chinese, come and negotiate with us, makes no sense at all. I yield for a brief moment on my time to my colleague from Utah for a minute or so. Well, I appreciate my colleague. He's always been fair and very gracious to me, and uh, I feel the same way towards him. And I understand his deep feelings about this matter, and I respect and appreciate them as well. But I'm not talking about necessarily negotiating with China directly, uh, other than what we can do. I'm talking about dealing with nations that literally are feeling the same way we do. And, and gradually multiplying the effect to get out, of, not just not just sending a message, but multiplying an effective way of getting the whole world to start saying, "Yeah, the United States is right. Yeah, this group of nations is right." And we can do that even outside of the the uh, world organizations that currently exist. But I, I would like my colleague to just look at that amendment and, and see see. I think he'll see some real good in it. And I think it'll get us farther down the pathway of doing what he knows needs to be done and I know needs to be done without necessarily uh, uh, causing a major trade war. And, and so I just bring that up to my colleagues for that purpose, respecting him and respecting what he's trying to do here. Uh, I think this plurilateral approach that I'm talking about goes far beyond just WTO and IMF and some of the other organizations, worldwide organizations. It means really doing effective diplomatic work to bring worldwide pressure to get people to live within certain monetary constraints. But I thank my colleague for allowing me to say my colleague, and I understand his good intentions and his desire to get the same place I do, which is get China behave fairly. Neither of us dispute that they do not. Uh, I would simply, and I will certainly look at his bill, but I would simply say to him is this, sort of, growing up in Brooklyn, we had to deal with a lot of bullies. The only time bullies give in is when you stand up to them. 
The proposal that my colleague has made does not stand up to China. The nations of the world have made their opinions clear. Just recently, Brazil did. China doesn't care. They will only care if there are sanctions, tough sanctions, that give consequences to their unfair and usually illegal by WTO standards action. Now, Mr. President, I'd like to talk about Speaker Boehner's remarks and Chairman Bernanke's remarks. Last night brought a milestone here in the Senate, Mr. President. For years, the government of China has been willfully breaking the rules of free trade without provoking a formal response from the U.S. government until yesterday. The full Senate, for the first time, went on record that it wanted to consider formal action to confront China's currency manipulation. It was a lopsided vote, bipartisan, majority of both parties, 79 senators in favor. We'll spend the next few days debating the particulars, but make no mistake about it. When it comes to China's unfair trade practices, there is a consensus to act in the Senate. Mr. President, it can be hard at times around here to get 79 votes to turn the lights on. When the majority leader and minority leader vote together to move forward on a major jobs boosting measure, we shouldn't delay in moving forward. But then today, less than 24 hours after the Senate saw the overwhelming vote in favor of moving forward to finally confront China with real action, the Speaker of the House of Representatives has suggested he wouldn't take up the bill if it passes the Senate. He called it dangerous. The Speaker's argument is behind the times. The only thing that would be dangerous would be to continue turning the other cheek while China mounts its assault on U.S. jobs, U.S. wealth, U.S. manufacturing. Up and down the line, they oppose fair practices. They're mercantilist. They're maximizing their wealth at the expense of American workers, American companies, and American jobs. Critics like the Speaker say the bill could start a trade war with China. Well, I have news, Mr. Speaker. We are already in a trade war with China, and it's not going that well. American companies are fighting for survival in the United States and around the globe, battling subsidized Chinese exports with a built-in price advantage of 20 to 40 percent. We cannot raise the white flag on American jobs, American wealth, American manufacturing. We can only succeed against Chinese comp we can successful we can compete successfully against Chinese competition at home in China and around the world, but only, only, only if we level the playing field. Our bill helps level that playing field. There's already a trade war going on, Mr. Ch Speaker. China is cheating to gain unfair advantage. It's about time we do something about it. As Mr. Samuelson said in his article in the Washington Post, the only thing worse than a trade war, and I believe that won't happen because China has more to lose in a trade war than we do, and if they do one thing, they, do it sm they are smart, and they won't cut their nose to spite their face. They may take a few sanctions, in response, but they're not going to create a trade war. Absolutely not. But the only thing worse than even a trade war is continuing our present policies where five and ten years from now America cannot get up off the ground because of unfair Chinese policies. House Speaker seems to want to sit out this fight. He seems to want us to take a hands-off approach to China. He says this is, quote, well beyond what Congress should be doing. Well, Mr. President, I'm aghast at that notion that the Speaker says fighting for American jobs against unfair practices that China foists upon us is well beyond what Congress should be doing. What should we be doing? There is nothing else Congress should be doing except rising to defend American jobs. And if he doesn't believe that these practices are unfair, he should just listen, the Speaker should, to Chairman Bernanke. Here's what he said this morning. The Chinese currency policy is blocking what might be a more normal recovery process in the global economy. It is hurting the recovery.
That is the top economist in the land hurting the recovery, Mr. Speaker. That's what Ben Bernanke said. That is beyond what Cong does the Speaker really think? It is beyond what Congress should be doing to confront something that's hurting the recovery? That everyone who studies it says is unfair? That no one has come up with a solution? Multilateral negotiations? Give me a break. China won't budge. We know that. You know, Mr. President, I find it ironic that the Speaker wants a hands-off approach on China's unfair currency practices, considering he, along with the rest of the Republican leadership in both the House and the Senate, just sent a letter a couple of weeks ago seeking to meddle in U.S. currency policies. Just two weeks ago, the Republican leadership in the House and Senate sent a letter to Chairman Bernanke trying to influence his handling of monetary policies in a highly inappropriate way. It was nothing short of a breach of a protocol that has long been observed, which is you don't put political pressure on the Federal Reserve because they need to handle monetary policy in an economic, not a political way. A former Fed official called that attempt to politically meddle in the Fed's independent policy making, quote, outrageous. Politico wrote that the letter, quote, was an audacious move against a central bank that prizes its political independence. A leading economist said, quote, it crosses a line that shouldn't be crossed. So let me get this straight. The Speaker and the House leadership feel it's okay to cross the line and try to strong arm the Fed, but it's not okay to have the will to stand up to China. This is totally inconsistent, totally inconsistent. It's hard to figure out how you could do one thing one week and say the other, the, the second, the next week. Unless, of course, the House leadership's goal is to hold back our economic recovery. I fear to think that. I fear to think that their goal is to make sure the economy is so bad so they might do what our Republican leader said was his number one goal, unseat President Obama. I shudder to think that millions of American households without jobs, with people looking and searching to find a way to provide some dignity for their families, they have to be political fodder for a goal to hold the economy back. So I don't want to embrace that conclusion, but it's hard to see, hard to see another explanation for, on the one hand, trying to twist the arm of the Fed when it comes to U.S. monetary policy, but when it comes to fighting back against China's to say, hands off. It's totally inconsistent. I also find the Speaker's position on this China currency measure strange, because if he blocks this measure, he's effectively thwarting the will of his own members. In the House, there are 225 co-sponsors, 61 Republicans at last count, for a measure similar to the one being debated in the Senate right now. It's clear there's a consensus in the House very similar to the consensus here in the Senate. So I would urge the Speaker, heed your own, the cha heed your own chamber, put this bill on the floor. Don't thwart your own members who want a chance to support this measure. Give it an up or down vote. Even if the House leadership doesn't want to vote for it, they should at least allow the will of the House to go forward. They should not suppress the collective will of their chamber. Because at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what side are you on? Two major candidates for president on the Republican side support this legislation. John Huntsman, who just got back from China, hardly known as a radical, said he would sign this bill. Now, he, I haven't talked to him, but I can tell you, having worked on this issue for six years, I am sure that former Ambassador Huntsman is just totally frustrated with the Chinese and knows what, unfortunately, the legislation introduced by his fellow Utah 
doesn't address that the Chinese don't react when you ask nicely. They don't react when you ask, period. They only react when there are consequences that are harmful to them if they continue an unfair anti-free trade policy. For some inexplicable reason, the Republican leadership in the House is siding with the Chinese government. This is not the time to go soft on China. The top economist in the country tells us China is holding back the recovery. Many other economists say that China, in its currency policies, is distorting, thwarting world trade. I have seen some even listed as one of the causes for the international recession that we have. And we know, we know, we know, it costs America in jobs. I want to relate what I related yesterday. Just one company in upstate New York. And I would remind some of the editorial writers and pundits who say, oh, this won't make a difference. It'll just move jobs from China to Bangladesh. They're five years beyond, behind the times. We're not talking about jobs that are in labor-intensive industries like toys or clothing or furniture. Those are gone. Those aren't coming back. We're talking about top-end, mainly middle-sized and smaller American manufacturers and producers who have to fight with one hand tied behind their back because of Chinese currency. So this company, which makes a ceramic that is put in uh, generators, electric generators and prevents pollution, and they have a great ceramic tool. They're doing fine. But a few years ago, China stole it. They just took it and stole it. But the head of the company told me he didn't mind because, you know, this, his growth was so large just from selling these in the United States and in Europe that if China wanted to sell them in China where they're building lots of power plants, so be it. But now, China's not only producing them for consumption in China, his product, they're producing them to export to America. And what this gentleman said was, he cannot, he'll compete head to head. But when China gets a built-in 30% advantage on intellectual property that they stole, how is he going to survive? That story can be repeated over and over again. Of course China's holding back our recovery. Of course China's policies lose us millions of American jobs and hundreds of billions of dollars of American wealth. And finally, this body, in a strictly bipartisan way, our bill has five lead Republican and five lead Democratic co-sponsors. We have equally criticized President Bush and President Obama for their failure to act. Finally, this body gets some resolve and the speaker says no. Well, you know what? I don't believe his no is going to stand. This is an issue that the American people know has to happen. This is something they care about. Democrats, Republicans, you look at the polling, there's no partisan divide on this one. Liberals, conservatives, you don't have to have a PhD in economics to know China's cheating us and playing unfairly with us. And I, believe, and I believe the pressure from members of both sides of the aisle and the other body, and more importantly from the American people and manufacturers all over the country, could work, could get the speaker to reconsider his view. And I please pray and hope that it does, because there's no greater step that we can take to restore jobs in America than to pass this important bill, get it enacted into law, and see for once our top-notch American companies be able to compete evenly, fair fight, with Chinese manufacturers. Thank you, and I yield the floor. And I note the absence of a quorum, Madam President. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
months ago, and uh, it, having to do with the endangerment finding of the EPA. And while it's a little bit complicated, let me just go back and put this in kind of a perspective. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, we were asked by then the Clinton administration to ratify a treaty called the Kyoto Treaty. This is a treaty that would, uh, it was aiming at reduction of greenhouse gases, anthropogenic gases, and this type of thing. Well, it didn't, uh, it didn't pass, and the reason it didn't pass, in fact, it, it went down uh, in, in, by 95 to nothing because of two things. We all declared in this body that we weren't going to ratify any treaty that, number one, was damaging economically to the country, and number two, would treat developing countries differently than developed nations. And of course, it's uh, missed both of those criteria. Now, after that happened, it became very popular by some of the more radical environmentalist groups that uh, enjoy the overregulation that we have so much of in this country. And uh, so they started introducing some of the uh, regular, uh, uh, different uh, bills. Uh, we had the McCain-Lieberman uh, bill of, o, uh, of 03, and again in 05, we had the Warner-Lieberman bill, several others, the Sanders-Boxer uh, bill, and I guess the last one was one, a House bill that was the uh, uh, Waxman-Markey bill. Well, anyway, these bills uh, were all aimed at what we can do in this country in, in order to restrict our use of CO2. Now, obviously, uh, and, and there's no disagreement on this line, that if we unilaterally in the United States of America reduce our CO2, it's not going to affect the CO2 re, uh, emissions worldwide, because this isn't where the problem is. And, and even the uh, administrator of the EPA, uh, the one that was appointed by uh, President Obama, uh, Lisa Jackson, the one I have a great deal of respect for, I asked her the question on the record. I said, if we were to pass any of these bills, the ones I just mentioned, that would have the effect of the Kyoto Treaty, but just on the United States, in reducing anthropogenic gases, would this have the effect of reducing CO2 emissions? And she said, no, because as I just pointed out, this would only affect the United States of America. So I would take, take that argument just one step further and say that it would have the effect of increasing, not decreasing, emissions because as our manufacturing base has to find power to generate itself, uh, they have to go where that is. So anyway, I only want to bring that up because um, th that effort is still going on today. Now, with all of these bills that were, have been before us, and I was, at the time of most of them, I was the chairman, when Republicans were majority, of the Environment and Public Works Committee, which had jurisdiction over this subject, and it was the one who stood on the floor and, and, uh, to defeat these bills, and it became easier each bill that came along. And the reason is, people recognize that while the science is in question, the economics are not. Uh, it had been uh, determined by a number of sources, including uh, WIFA, which is a branch of the Wharton School of Economics, uh, and, and MIT, uh, CRA, Charles Rivers Associates. The range of the cost of a cap-and-trade bill is always in the range of between three and four hundred billion dollars a year. I have a thing, you know, it's confusing when you talk about these large numbers and people's eyes glaze, glaze over, they don't really understand, and I have a hard time understanding, how does that affect me? You know, how does that affect me and my 20 kids and grandkids out in Oklahoma? So what I do is I have a system, and I recommend it to my, my friends in the United States Senate, that uh, I take the number of family uh, income tax returns that are filed each year, get a current figure, and then I do my math. Well, this, this uh, range between three and four hundred billion dollars, when you reduce it down to what it would cost each family, it's in excess of three thousand dollars a year. Now, even if you, if you do this, and if we were to pass something like this, it still wouldn't reduce the emissions. And that's the, the thing that we need to get over. Anyway, in order for, when, when President Obama saw this, he said, well, there's no way in the world that the, uh, the, the United States Senate or the House now are going to pass a cap-and-trade bill. Uh, so I'm going to do it by the, just by regulation. And you've been hearing us talk about the overregulation. Some, sometimes we're inclined to think that our, the, the anti-business uh, attitude of this administration is just in overtaxation and this type of thing. It's not true. Also, overregulation is a killer.
And in this case, we're talking about the overregulation and, and something that is that is, is is something that we cannot sustain. So, when the uh, in order for the president to be able to do through regulation what he could not do through uh, legislation, he had to have what they call an endangerment finding. That is, the the uh, Environmental Protection Agency had to come up with a, a conclusion that CO2 is dangerous to your health. It's called an endangerment finding. Well, um, I was getting ready to go over to this thing in Copenhagen that they have every year. The, the, um, uh, the, those people who are promoting these uh, programs have these COP meetings. And I was going to uh, get ready to go over there. And we had uh, Administrator Jackson before our committee. And I remember looking over at her and I said, well, I'm leaving for Copenhagen tomorrow. Shall I assume that you're going to have an endangerment as, uh, 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 finding as soon as I leave town? And uh, she didn't answer, but she smiled because she smiles a lot. Anyway, that's what happened when I left and they had an endangerment finding. Well, endangerment finding has to be based on, on science. And that's where, where this uh, in, in Inspector General's uh, uh, report came in. Again, this is new stuff just uh, two days ago. I would requested this report. 18 months ago to, for them to look at the endangerment finding and see if this, in fact, is uh, based on, on science. And, uh, of course, they came out with the report. It was, it was just released. It confirms that the endangerment finding, the very foundation of President Obama's job-destroying job regulatory agenda, was rushed, these are using their words, rushed, biased, and flawed. It caused the scientific integrity of the EPA's decision-making process into question and undermines the credibility of the endangerment finding. Keeping in mind, you have to have an endangerment finding before you start regulating uh, all this stuff. Well, the Inspector General's uh, investigation uncovered that the EPA failed to engage in the required record-keeping process leading up to the endangerment finding. Well, that's a requirement by law, so they did not comply with the law at that time. It also did not follow its own peer review procedures. Peer review is something that is required. They didn't do it. And uh, so anyway, they admitted, and uh, Administrator Jackson admit, readily admitted, uh, in, way back in 2009, that the EPA had outsourced its scientific review to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, this is interesting, because they're going back to say, all right, you guys, you do the peer review on the thing that you have developed. Well, the, it doesn't work that way, and, and I think at that time we were complaining about it. And so even the EPA still refused to conduct its own independent review of the science, as the EPA Inspector General found, what everyone thinks of the UN science. The EPA is still required by its own procedures, by law, to conduct an independent view, a review. Of course, uh, I have long warned the IPCC process uh, you know, and, and it's uh, what they have been doing in the past. In fact, it was six years ago I sent a letter to Dr. Pachari. He was the head of the IPCC, specifically raising the many weaknesses of the IPCC's peer review uh, process. But Dr. Pachari dismissed my concerns. Here's how Reuters had an article on how he responded to my request. He said, quote, I'm quoting now from Reuters, he said, in the one-page letter, uh, Pachari denies that the IPCC has an alarmist bias and says, I have deep commitment to the integrity and objectivity of the IPCC process. Pachari's main argument is that the IPCC compromises both scientists and, uh, and more than 100, uh, uh, comprises scientists and more than 130 government, uh, governments who approve the IPCC's report line by line. Now that's what he said, that was what was reported. And then as I predicted, it all came apart uh, for the IPCC. On the Senate floor last year, I highlighted several media reports uncovering serious errors and possible fraud by the IPCC. IPCC, now that's the United Nations we're talking about. They're the ones that started all this thing. ABC News, The Economist, Time Magazine, Times uh, of London, among many others, reported that the IPCC C's research contains embarrassing flaws, using their language, and that the IPCC chairman and scientists knew of the flaws, but published them 
um, uh, anyway. The media reports uncovered a number of non-peer reviewer studies that the IPCC used to make baseless claims, including that global warming would number one. And listen to this. This came out. This is IPCC stuff that's been totally reviewed. They said it was going to melt, melt the Himalayan glaciers by 2035. Didn't happen. Uh, it was going to add 40 percent of the Amazon rainforest. Uh, rainforest endangered by global warming didn't happen. Melt mountain ice uh, in uh, at the Alps, Andes, and Africa didn't happen. It was slash, uh, slash crop production by 50 percent in North Africa by 2020. It's something that is not is even going on. And it, these embarrassments led to a number of these uh, same publications to demand that the IPCC come clean on the review process of the IPCC. Financial Times, I want to read, but, you know, to let you know how serious this is. The Financial Times, talking about the IPCC, quote, now it is time to implement fundamental reforms that would reduce the risk of bias and errors appearing in future IPCC assessments, increase transparency, and open up the whole field of climate research to the widest possible range of scientific views. Time Magazine. Now, Time Magazine has always kind of been on the other side of this issue. You might remember Time Magazine had on their cover this last polar bear standing on the last cube of ice. You know, we're going to have a, uh, in, in, uh, 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 you know, it, we're all going to die. But anyway, Time Magazine said that Glacier Gate, this is when they talked about the glaciers all melting. You see, Glacier Gate is a black eye for the IPCC and for the climate science community as a whole. The Economist Magazine. This mixture of sloppiness, lack of communication, and high-handedness gives the IPCC's critics a lot to work with. Newsweek came out, and I'm quoting now from Newsweek, some of the IPCC's most quoted data and recommendations were taken straight out of unchecked activist brochures, newspaper articles, and corporate reports, including claims of plummeting crop yields in Africa and the rising costs of warming-related natural disasters, both of which have been refuted by academic studies, just as damaging many climate scientists have responded to critiques by questioning the integrity of their critics uh, and uh, rather than by supplying data and reasonable arguments. That was in New Newsweek. So their analysis was that they're doing all this stuff and, and they, they resort to name calling and this type of thing because they don't have a logical response for it. Now last year, uh, and this was Keeping in mind, this is after I requested the IG report, the Inspector General's report, and before, uh, and, and, and still a year ago, in a speech I made right here, I said there is a, quote, there is a crisis of confidence in the IPCC. The challenges uh, to the integrity and credibility of the IPCC merit a closer examination by the U.S. Congress. The ramifications of the IPCC spread far and wide, most notably to the Environmental Protection Agency's finding that greenhouse gases from mobile sources endanger public health and welfare. EPA's findings, still quoting myself, and this is before the report came out from the Inspector General, EPA's finding uh, rests in large measure on the IPCC's conclusions and, and EPA has accepted them wholesale without an independent assessment. At this pivotal time, as the Obama EPA is preparing to enact policies potentially costing trillions of dollars and thousands of jobs, the EPC, uh, IPCC's errors make plain that we need openness, transparency, and accountability in the scientific research financed by the U.S. taxpayers. Now, that was a year before the IG report came out, and it's almost exactly what the IG report said just this last week. Two months before that speech, I had asked the EPA Administrator, Lisa Jackson, to delay the EPA endangerment finding based on climate gate. She told me, uh, and I quote now, and I, I have a lot of respect for her, by the way, I've professed that many times. She's one who normally I'll ask her a question, she'll come out and give an answer, even though it may be an unpopular answer with her boss, President Obama. She said, I do not agree that the IPCC has been totally discredited in any way. In fact, I think it's important to understand that the IPCC is a body that follows impartial and open objective assessments. See, she's saying essentially the same thing. 
The, uh, yes, they have had concerns about email. I do not defend the conduct of those who sent those emails. Here they're talking about Climate Gate. We all remember those secret emails that went back and forth between the principals to, to uh, somehow uh, fraudulently manipulate the science. Uh, she goes on to say there's a peer review which is part of the IPCC process. There are numerous, numerous groups in uh, teams and independent researchers all a part of uh, coming up with IPCC's fi uh, findings such that even the IPCC has said that while we need to investigate and ensure that our scientists are to a standard of scientific co conduct that we can be proud of, uh, we stand behind our findings. So we're all, they're all whitewashing the work of the IPCC. Again, that was before the uh, IG report came out. But it didn't work because there are magazines throughout the world publications who generally were on the other side of this argument or their side of this argument. The Guardian, for example, said, and this is right out of The Guardian, talking about Climate Gate and how they're a disgrace, they said, quote, pretending that this isn't a real crisis isn't going to make it go away. Uh, the Daily Telegraph said this scandal could well be the greatest in modern science. This is what they, they're, they're talking about with, uh, with Climate Gate. The Atlantic uh, Monthly. Uh, the stink of intellectual corruption is overpowering. Now, let's remember the economic ramifications of global warming regulations imposed upon the EPA under the Clean Air Act will cost American consumers somewhere in the range of 300 to 400 billion dollars a year. This is not to mention the absurd result that EPA readily admits that they need to hire 230,000 additional employees and spend an additional $21 billion to implement its greenhouse gas regime if they are not given wide discretion to circumvent the law. And all of this economic pain is for nothing, no gain at all. As the EPA administrator admitted before our committee, it would have no effect on the overall uh, release of, uh, of, of uh, anthropogenic gases. Also of note, uh, what happened to the the EDA's vow in 2009 that the agency would commit to high standards of transparency because, and I'm quoting now, the success of our environmental efforts depends on earning the, and maintaining the trust of a public we serve or uh, Obama advisor John Holdren's promise that the administration would make decisions based on the best science possible because the president said the public must be uh, able to trust the science and scientific process informing the public of the decisions. Now, given what has come to light in the report, it appears that the Obama EPA cannot be trusted on the most uh, consequential decision in agency that they've ever made. So I have already called upon the uh, committees in the Senate. This would be my committee the, on which I am the ranking member, the Environment and Public Works Committee, to have an investigation. My gosh, an IG report. I don't ever recall in the years I've been here, an IG report coming out, Inspector General's report, where there, wasn't, uh, there weren't uh, numerous hearings to find out, to probe in to see just why the, uh, they came up with the decisions they made. So I, you know, I've tried for years, for 10 years now, to, to pursue this thing with the, the various bills that were introduced to do legislatively uh, what they, to implement these requirements. And then when we see that they're unable to do it, and if you look around this, the United States Senate, there are only about 30 votes now. You're not even halfway there. They don't have half the number of votes to impose cap and trade. They don't have it. It's not here. And that's why the president's trying to do it through uh, regulations. It's kind of interesting you put this in perspective. There's this super committee they keep talking about, the 12 uh, people, uh, six Democrats, six Republicans, uh, three from the House, three from the Senate. And they're supposed to come up. Their goal is to find one and a half trillion dollars in 10 years. One and a half trillion dollars in 10 years. We have a, a president in his own budget. And, uh, you know, this isn't Democrats or Republicans or House or Senate. This is the president. His three budgets that he came out with have just under a five trillion dollar deficit. Now that's just inconceivable. I can remember uh, coming down here in the mid-90s when uh, uh, President Clinton was in power and the, the first uh, uh, $1.5 trillion uh, budget that we had, I just was complaining this is not sustainable. Now it's a trillion and a half dollars over and above what it costs to run America. And obviously that can't be done. And so when you stop and think about the fact that it should be fairly easy to find $1.5 trillion, that would just be his deficit for one year.
to find uh, one and a half trillion dollars. Now, if they were successful, and this is kind of hard to follow, but if they're successful in implementing by regulation what they could not do by legislation and have a cap and trade, that would cost a minimum of $300 billion a year, or multiply that by 10, that would be $3 trillion. And so we have this super committee out there trying to find a million and a half. At the same time, they're advocating increasing the cost to America by $3 trillion. It's, it's, it's not, not believable. Well, anyway, uh, I think it's very important that we all, and, and I, I'm really on the floor now, uh, uh, trying to gather support uh, for having a hearing. You, you can't have an IG report talking about the flawed product of the uh, EPA, of the I, IPCC, of the United Nations, and not have some kind of investigation. So hope we'll be able to do that. With that, I yield the floor. I uh, suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
got an overwhelming vote yesterday. There aren't many times when uh, a piece of legislation like this on a, on a specific topic gets the kind of overwhelming support to move it forward as we saw yesterday in the vote that took place and now we're considering the bill. When I go across Pennsylvania, uh, other, than, other than parts of our state that have been devastated by floods, most of the eastern uh, part of Pennsylvania, everything who drew a line down the middle of our state and moved to the east, a lot of communities devastated by flooding. Other than that issue, the number one issue, of course, for the people of our state, and I think the people of the United States uh, in total, is the issue of jobs. And in their frustration, uh, they look to Washington for action, for solutions. And too often what they see when they turn on the television set or, or read about what's happening here, they see a lot, of, um, a lot of fighting, a lot of bickering, a lot of back and forth, and frankly a lot of, a lot of politics, but not enough action on the question of jobs. What we have before us today is not some um, esoteric um, bill about currency. It is somewhat about that, obviously, uh, but it's not, uh, it really isn't that. This is a bill that speaks directly to that frustration that Americans feel. I know the people of Pennsylvania feel. There aren't many places in Pennsylvania I can go where I talk about this issue of China for many years cheating on currency and us, us losing uh, lots and lots of jobs because of it. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs because of that. There are many places in our state where I can go to talk about that and I don't receive or the, the uh, point of view that I express doesn't receive uh, unanimous uh, support. Uh, this is a very real issue for people. This isn't far off. They know that just, just like in other aspects of life, uh, especially on something as consequential and significant as international trade, um, most people understand that when you're, when you're involved in that kind of endeavor, you've got to play by the rules. Every country has to, should play by the rules. And when you have a country as big and as significant in the international economy or the international marketplace as China, not playing by the rules, cheating time after time after time, giving their workers and their industries an unfair advantage, I think most people know what that means. And it's not just a question of fairness and playing by the rules, it's the, the, uh, the impact of that cheating. The impact of that cheating is Americans lose jobs and have lost jobs. So we have to take action. We, there's, t the time is up. We've been talking about this for years pleading with uh, China in one way or another, urging them, pushing them. Um, but the time for that is over. The time uh, to act is now. And this is a prudent piece of legislation. It does a couple of things. Basically what it does is, at long last, is uh, help, a manufacture, help American manufacturers uh, and our workers by clarifying that our trade enforcement laws can and should be used to address uh, currency undervaluation. It also provides an opportunity for us to improve oversight, uh, oversight by establishing objective criteria to identify misaligned currencies and imposing tough consequences for offenders. So it doesn't put into place a new rule for, for international trade. It just says if you violate the rules, there are going to be consequences that our Treasury Department or our Commerce Department are going to take action. And no matter what administration is, uh, uh, is in office, a Democratic administration or a Republican administration, and I could point to uh, a number of senators in both parties, I think I'm one of them, uh, who, have, who have been urging this administration and the prior administration to take stronger, more decisive action. And for a variety of reasons, uh, they, haven't, uh, they haven't done that. Not to say they haven't been working on it, not to say they haven't been pushing their, their counterparts in China, um, but I think we've been uh, far too timid in the approach that we take. Because again, this isn't some far off issue. This is about American jobs and whether or not we're going to stand by and allow more and more, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands more American jobs to be lost in the next decade as we've seen uh, hemorrhage from our, from our society in the last 10 years.
And one of the causes, one of the, the, one of the substantial factors in that job loss, not the only, but one of, is, um, is the cheating that China does on its currency. It's, it's as if, you, it's as if you're, you're running, you're to, we're, we're telling our workers and our companies, look, you're going to have a, a foot race with uh, Chinese companies and Chinese workers, and we're going we're to have this, this competition as we have every day in the international marketplace. But, but China is going to start at the, if this is a 100-yard dash, they're going to start at the, the 20 or 25 or 30-yard line. And then we're going to start the race and see how you do. Uh, it's completely unfair to our workers. It undermines their ability to compete, even if they're working as hard as they can, even if they have a high skill level, even if the company has invested time in training those workers, has invested capital in the, in the equipment and the technology. Uh, it, it, sometimes it doesn't matter what the company does to improve its production, to improve its efficiency. It doesn't matter what the workers do. They can, prepare, they can go to school and learn and prepare and get trained. But if they're at a, at a 15 or 20 or 25 percent disadvantage, and by the way, they're the, they're the low estimates. It, th this has been a problem above 30, uh, 30 percent or higher at times. But no matter what the percentage is, we know that uh, there's been a lot of cheating, and we know that it's costing us jobs. So it's time for action. This morning at the uh, Joint Economic Committee hearing, we had uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, and I asked him about, about currency, and I actually read to him some uh, statements he has made in the past about, about currency and about the, the uh, role that China has played. Uh, the adverse role, the, the, the role that, um, the, that I'm as frustrated as any American about. And I asked him about that, and it's, it's been reported already, a uh, summation of his, of his comments. But in, in addition to commenting about the impact on our workers and our companies, he talked about the impact of China's currency policies on the global economic recovery. So this isn't just an adverse uh, consequence for America, for the United States. This is an impediment to a full and robust recovery around the world. Uh, so this isn't some, this isn't just limited to the impact on our workers and our companies. It has worldwide reach, worldwide impact, and has uh, uh, worldwide consequence. So the United States' uh, unwillingness so far to, uh, to crack down on China's currency and to crack down on the, uh, what I would assert is manipulation. Uh, some will say, well, it might be something different than that, but I think it's basic manipulation, cheating. Um, it's, um, it, it's, I think it's the step we have to take now to have rules in place uh, for, for how we react to their cheating and then to have uh, very tough consequences. That's what's in the bill. Unfortunately, this, is, uh, this inability to, to respond appropriately or assertively or aggressively is one of many, uh, I, w I would argue, one of many pieces of a flawed trade strategy uh, that have been, have, been, uh, have been a prevailing point of view uh, over the course of two administrations. And um, we're going to have some debates about trade coming up. And we're going to see some interesting alliances, uh, some interesting coalitions here. But our, uh, our uh, flawed uh, trade strategy, if, if, if we can even call it a strategy, uh, has failed over many years, failed our workers and failed uh, our companies. But at least today, we'll get to the, the debate on the trade agreements later, but at least today and this week, we can finally, finally make progress on an issue which has cost um, has cost the American people lots and lots of jobs. Let me give you a sense of what could happen if we're able to pass legislation, this legislation. The Economic Policy Institute, one of the many um, think tanks across Washington of various points of view who have studied this issue uh, in, on June the 17th of this year in a report by the Economic Policy Institute, and I'm broadly summarizing, but uh, the, one of the many conclusions they reached about this issue is that if, if China revalued its currency by 28.5%, now many would say it's, it's, a, it's a bigger problem than 28.5% or 28.5% advantage that their workers and their companies have, uh, 
if they revalue to that level at 28.5%, the growth in our uh, gross domestic product in the United States would support 1,631,000 uh, U.S. jobs. And if other Asian countries uh, also revalued their currency, then 2,250,000 American jobs would be created. So um, even if someone could, <laughs> could prove that those numbers are off by 10,000 or 20,000, or even if you could debate the number being off, because um, uh, some might reach different numbers. But I've seen numbers that high, and I've also seen numbers in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs. So any policy that we can enact, enact here, in this case being, being appropriately tough with China on their the cheating they do on currency. If, if passage of legislation like this, like the one we're considering, leads to the creation of 1.6 million jobs, just as it relates to, to um, having China play by the rules, why wouldn't we pass legislation to do that? When people are saying over and over again to us, please do something about jobs, and sometimes the response is, well, we're trying, but we can't get agreement. Well, we're trying, but we don't have all the solutions. We finally have a piece of legislation that will create jobs for sure and has bipartisan, broad, broad, and substantial bipartisan support. We should pass this bill because it'll send two messages that are badly needed right now uh, from us to the American people. Number one, that you're focused on job creation in the near term, not 10 years from now, but in the next year or two. Uh, so it's a, it's a very specific answer to their request of us as their elected representatives that we're focused on enacting legislation that will create jobs. Secondly, the message we'll send to the American people is that we finally get it, that finally Democrats and Republicans can come together on a very serious uh, issue that is, that is of great consequence to families that have been devastated by job loss. They are finally coming together, Democrat and Republican, working together to have a unanimous vote uh, on a job creation bill. It is that simple. And anyone who tries to make it any more complicated than that is probably trying to mislead you because it is that simple. And we need to focus our attention in the days ahead to get this legislation passed uh, and to finally uh, take action in a way that's directed at job creation in a bipartisan way. Madam President, I would yield the floor and note the absence of